I have entitled this talk, My Atheist Friend, to highlight some common ground that I believe I share with the new atheists. The four major proponents, or four horsemen, so to speak, as they are called, of the new atheism are Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Daniel Dennett, and, and Sam Harris. And one might ask, well, what is new about the new atheism? After all, atheism has been around for a while. It seems that the new element of atheism is a direct attack on faith as such. The new atheists argue that faith is dangerous since it is irrational. And Richard Dawkins might go even farther and consider faith to be delusional, uh, hence the title of his book, The God Delusion. Since faith is dangerous, they argue, it must be opposed. In this context, uh, I wish to illustrate how we may engage atheists in charitable dialogue. The way to engage anyone in charitable dialogue is to demonstrate a willingness to consider and discuss different ideas, and choosing areas of common ground to begin the discussion. Through discussion of areas of common ground, our faith can then be explained as reasonable in the midst of a secular culture. Now, of course, if no common ground can be found, the best thing to do is just go have a beer. And there is great craft beer available right here in Marquette, and so remember that option. So tonight I, I wish to highlight two areas of common ground that we share with the new atheists. First, interest in natural sciences, and second, concerns about fundamentalist extremism within religion. Understand that when our discussion turns toward matters of faith, I will be speaking from a Catholic perspective. Now, while I certainly un, uh, respect uh, other religions and other people of faith, uh, for some reason, uh, and I bet you can hardly guess why, uh, I am best qualified to speak from faith, uh, speak about faith from a Catholic perspective. So let us turn our attention to two areas of common ground that I believe I have with my atheist friend. First, like the new atheists, I and the Catholic Church have an interest in the sciences. When I was in grade school, if you asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would have said a scientist. Albert Einstein was my hero. I guess I was a bit of an atypical grade school student. Uh, and from grade school and throughout high school, science was clearly my favorite subject. And in particular, I really enjoyed physics. Physicists get to play with all kinds of cool, neat toys like particle <laughs> accelerators. Now, beyond my own personal interest, the Catholic Church has long had an interest in and supported the sciences. In fact, the scientist who first proposed the Big Bang Theory was a Catholic priest, Father George Lemaitre. Many other influential scientists were Catholic priests, including Franciscan friar Roger Bacon, who was an early proponent of modern scientific method. In 1574, Father Ignazio Dante made important observations that the equinox was 11 days earlier than the calendar indicated, which led to the reform of the calendar. Father Jean-Félix Picard, an astronomer, um, perhaps Jean-Luc Picard of Star Trek might get a name for there. Uh, uh, in the years 1669 to 1670, accurately measured the size of the Earth and his calculation was off by only 0.44%. He also developed instruments that were essential for drafting Isaac Newton's theory of universal gravitation. 
Of course, we remember that Abbot Gregor Mendel is the father of modern genetics. Father Julius Newland was the chemist who invented synthetic rubber. And Father Michael Heller was the 2008 winner of the Templeton Prize for his work in cosmology. The church's interest in science can also be understood in its establishment of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. In fact, the Pontifical Academy of Sciences has its roots in the Academy of the Lynxes, which was founded in Rome in 1603 as the first exclusively scientific academy in the world. Moreover, the Vatican also operates an observatory. By the way, the current director of the Vatican Observatory is Brother Guy Consolmagno, a Jesuit and a native of Detroit, Michigan. And in 2014, he received the Carl Sagan Medal from the American Astronomical Society D Division for Planetary Sciences for his excellence in public communication about planetary sciences. So in, in discussing the Catholic Church's interest in science, it is also important to note that the theory of evolution and faith are not necessarily opposed. Uh, for instance, in 1950, Pope Pius XII in his encyclical Humani Generis, as well as Pope John Paul II in his address to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences in October of 1996, indicated that Faith is, it is not incompatible to faith to hold that the origin of the human body came about through pre-existing living matter, provided that one holds that God creates the immortal human soul. So to round out our discussion of the shared interest in science that I and the Catholic Church have with the new atheists, I wish to state emphatically <clears throat> that affirming the, the existence of God is not incompatible with science. And to illustrate this point, I would like to take a look at uh, the very famous Charles Darwin himself. Darwin stated in his autobiography, quote, reason tells me of the extreme difficulty or rather impossibility of conceiving this immense and wonderful universe, including man with his capability of looking far backwards and far into futurity as the result of blind chance or necessity. When thus reflecting, I feel compelled to look to a first cause, having an intelligent mind in some degree analogous to that of man, and I deserve to be called a theist." End of quote. Moreover, Darwin holds that the theory of evolution is more consistent with the laws of nature established by the Creator. Thus, Darwin affirms the existence of a Creator who established these very laws of nature. He stated in The Origin of the Species, and I quote, Authors of the highest eminence seem to be fully satisfied with the view that each species has been independently created. To my mind, it accords better with what we know of the laws impressed on matter by the Creator that the production and extinction of past and present inhabitants of the world should have been due to secondary causes, like those determining the birth and death of the individual. When I view all beings not as special creations, but as descent, lineal descendants of some few beings which lived long before the first bed of the Silurian system was deposited, they seem to me to become ennobled." End of quote. Now, when Richard Dawkins asserts that Darwin was an atheist in his book, The God Delusion, Dawkins apparently overlooks these passages in which Darwin himself asserts the contrary, that he is a theist. Being a theist, however, does not necessarily mean that one is a person of faith. A theist may affirm that God exists, but does not necessarily affirm that God is any way present and active in our lives. 
Nonetheless, I, I point to Charles Darwin as another illustration that that science and the and holding to the existence of God are not incompatible. In the discussion that I have just outlined, I began with an area of common ground that we share with the new atheists, namely an interest in the sciences. In the course of that discussion, I have pointed to many prominent scientists who are either men of faith or at least affirm that God exists. Thus, beginning with an area of common ground, I have hoped to illustrate that faith and science are not incompatible. If they were incompatible, why would so many people and so many prominent scientists also be men of faith? Now, Richard Dawkins admits that he is puzzled by scientists who also claim to be people of faith. I suggest the reason why Dawkins is puzzled is that he misunderstands what faith is. Dawkins thinks that faith is contrary to reason. And as our discussion this evening continues, I will begin with another area of common ground that we share with the new atheists and show not only that faith is not contrary to reason, but rather faith divorced from reason is not properly faith at all. So the second area of common ground that I share with my atheist friend is a concern about fundamentalist extremism within religion. History speaks of innumerable atrocities that people have committed in the name of religion. And anyone who cares about humanity must denounce such atrocities. We share this in common with the new atheists. It is absolutely wrong to commit evil in the name of religion. Now, the new atheists see the roots of such violence and horror in faith itself. For example, Sam Harris in his book, The End of Faith, states, and I quote, There seems, however, to be a problem with some of our most cherished beliefs about the world that they are leading us inexorably to kill one another. A glance at history or at the pages of any newspaper reveal that ideas which divide one group of human beings from another, only to unite them in slaughter, generally have their roots in religion. It seems that if our species ever eradicates itself through war, it will not be because it was written in the stars, but because it was written in our books. It is what we do with words like God and paradise and sin in the present that will determine our future." End of quote. As Harris continues, he notes the difference between religious extremists and religious moderates, but holds that these moderate, moderating tendencies within religion do not come from faith itself, but rather the religious moderate has been influenced by modernity and in light of modern scientific findings has eschewed extremist tendencies of faith. Thus, for Harris, there is nothing in faith per se that can save one from falling into extremism. Richard Dawkins makes a similar point in his book, The God Delusion. He says, and I quote, there are then people whose religious faith takes them right outside the enlightened con consensus of my moral zeitgeist. They represent what I have called the dark side of religious absolutism, and they are often called extremists. But my point in this section is that even mild and moderate religion helps to provide the climate of faith in which extremism naturally flourishes. Now Dawkins continues, as long as we accept the principle that religious faith must be respected simply because it is religious faith, it is hard to withhold respect from the faith of Osama bin Laden and the suicide bombers. The alternative, one so transparent that it should need no urging, is to abandon the principle of automatic respect for religious faith. 
This is one reason why I do everything in my power to warn people against faith itself, not just so-called extremist faith. The teachings of moderate religion, though not extremist in themselves, are an open invitation to extremism." End of quote. Now the reason why authors such as Harris and Dawkins see all religion and faith to be dangerous is that they hold that faith is altogether unreasonable. Therefore, it is faith itself that renders oneself susceptible to embracing utterly irrational and extreme positions, and so faith must be opposed outright. Similarly, similarly you know, those of us uh, uh, who are people of faith uh, denounce atrocities committed in the name of religion. And I also see the roots of religious extremism in the abandonment of reason. I share that in common with the new atheists. Both I and the new atheists see the roots of religious extremism in the abandonment of reason. And to illustrate this point, I wish to refer to a dialogue on the subject of Christianity and Islam conducted around the year 1391 between the Orthodox Byzantine Emperor Emmanuel II and an educated Persian. Pope Benedict referred to this dialogue in his 2006 address at the University of Regensburg. Now, the Pope was attacked for being anti-Islamic, but his point was not to oppose Islam per se, but rather to highlight the inextricable relationship between faith and reason. The dialogue between Manuel II and the Persian dealt with the structures of faith in the Bible and the Quran. At one point, the dialogue <coughs> turned to the question of holy war, and Manuel II went into detail to explain why spreading the faith through violence is unreasonable. Manuel II stated that not acting reasonably is contrary to God's nature. Not acting reasonably is contrary to God's nature. I wish to build upon the, this point that Emperor Emmanuel II made. Acting unreasonably is contrary to the nature of God, and faith divorced from reason is not faith at all. Despite the common concern that we and the new atheists share about religious extremism and grave unspeakable atrocities committed in the name of religion, we diverge on a central point. The new atheists assert that faith as such fosters such extremism because faith is inherently irrational. Therefore, faith ought to be opposed. In contrast, I will argue that faith as such does not foster such extremism because faith is essentially reasonable. Faith divorced from reason is not really faith at all. Faith as such is inseparable from reason, and therefore true faith does not foster such extremism. To help us see the interplay of faith and reason, I would like to draw an analogy between the decision to marry and the act of faith. The decision to marry flows from both head and heart. Both the head and the heart intersect to make a lifelong commitment to another person. First of all, the decision to marry is a matter of the heart. One becomes attracted to the other person and desires to be with the other. When one falls in love, the kind of love that leads to a decision to marry, the other person is seen as good for me and desirable. One might echo the sentiments of Adam, who, upon seeing Eve, exclaimed, This one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Unique to the marital love of a man and woman, is the desire to give themselves to each other and to belong to each other. 
The eminent personalist philosopher Dietrich von Hildebrand put it this way, and I quote, it is true that in every kind of love one gives oneself in one way or another, but here the giving is literally complete and ultimate. When a man and woman love each other in this way, they give themselves to each other at the very moment they begin to love. The man wants to belong to the woman and her to belong to him. The woman wants to belong to the man and him to belong to her. All love certainly desires a reciprocity which is free from every shade of egoism. But in conjugal love there is an aspiration, not merely for a return of affection in general, but for the unique love whereby the beloved belongs to the lover in an entirely exclusive manner as he in turn wants to belong to the beloved. And so the decision to marry flows from this matter of the heart, but it is also a matter of the head. Knowledge begets love, and one must know the beloved in order to love him. And I'd like to take my parents as an example of this. Uh, my parents met at a, a box social fundraiser uh, you know, so at, at their church. So when, when they did this, the women all made box lunches uh, that the men would bid on and purchase. And uh, my dad bought the lunch that my mom prepared, and that's how they met. Now, mom admits that initially she was not attracted to dad. <laughs> but the more she came to know him, the more she fell in love with him. Knowledge begets love. And the decision to marry is also a matter of the head as well of the, as the heart. In addition, reason needs to consider many factors in order to inform the decision to marry, to make a lifelong commitment to another person. If the decision to marry is made irrationally, serious problems usually result. For example, in making the decision to marry, a person should exercise his or her reason in asking some of the following questions. Well, how does my boyfriend or girlfriend handle money? And how did their ha family handle money? Is my boyfriend or girlfriend generous, and can I give examples of that? Have I seen my boyfriend or girlfriend interact with children, and if so, does he or she show the qualities of being a good mother or father? Can I give examples of how my boyfriend or girlfriend treats me with respect? Can I give examples of how my boyfriend or girlfriend shows responsibility? Is my boyfriend or girlfriend honest? Can I give examples for that? How did the family of my boyfriend or girlfriend handle disagreements, arguments, or problems? Can I openly talk with my boyfriend or girlfriend, or are there things I'm really afraid to say? Does my boyfriend or girlfriend share his or her feelings with me? Is my boyfriend or girlfriend faithful? Are they able to say no to sex? What do I share in common with my boyfriend or girlfriend? Is my boyfriend or girlfriend selfish? Does my boyfriend or girlfriend sacrifice himself or herself or for others? Can I give examples of that self-sacrifice? What about my boyfriend or girlfriend irritates me? And can I live with this irritation for the rest of my life? Because after all, it's a myth that things will automatically change after the marriage. <laughs> 
Can I work out disagreements constructively with my boyfriend or girlfriend? Can I give examples of that? Is my boyfriend or girlfriend controlling or jealous? Does my boyfriend or girlfriend use alcohol? And if yes, does he or she do so moderately? Or is my boyfriend and girlfriend engaged in using drugs? These are all kinds of questions that can be asked. Now, this is not meant to be a complete list, but I think you get the idea that the decision to marry should not be entered blindly or unreasonably. A healthy decision to marry is a matter of both the heart and the head. Without the heart, the relationship and the decision to marry will lack affection and, and be lifeless and joyless. Without the head, one might decide to marry someone who does not display evidence that he is willing to sacrifice and give himself to you, and the results can be disastrous and painful. However, when head and heart converge, there is deep longing for the mutual giving and belonging to each other, and one sees evidence that the other is willing to make that commitment to. So in the decision to marry, if it is a good decision, if it is a mature decision, it engages both head and heart. Similar to the decision to marry, the act of faith flows from both head and heart along with the power of God's grace. With our head, we come to see that what God has revealed to us is reasonable. With our heart, we fall in love with God and we long to commit our life to Him. And we can reach this understanding and make this commitment only <coughs> under the light and the power of God's grace. And so at this point, I would like to address the assertion of the new atheists that faith is unreasonable. When faith appears unreasonable to someone, it is because the intelligible reasons for faith are not understood. For example, I would like to address the assertion of Richard Dawkins that it is mad to believe in the central doctrine of Christianity that Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sin. Dawkins states in his book, The God Delusion, and I quote, New Testament theology adds a new injustice, topped off by a new sadomasochism whose viciousness even the Old Testament barely exceeds. It is, when you think about it, remarkable that a religion should adopt an instrument of torture and execution as its sacred symbol, often worn around the neck." End of quote. And he continues, and I quote, But now the sadomasochism. God incarnated himself as a man, Jesus, in order that he should be tortured and executed in atonement for the hereditary sin of Adam. Ever since Paul expounded this repellent doctrine, Jesus has been worshipped as the Redeemer of all our sins. Not just the past sin of Adam, future sins as well, whether future people decided to commit them or not. End of quote. And finally he adds, I have described atonement, the central doctrine of Christianity, as vicious, sadomasochistic, and repellent. We should also dismiss it as barking mad, but for its ubiquitous familiarity which has dulled our objectivity. If God wanted to forgive our sins, why not just forgive them without having himself tortured and executed in payment? End of quote. Now Dawkins has completely missed the point and has failed to see the intrinsic reasonableness of this central Christian doctrine. 
that Jesus died for the forgiveness of our sins. Now, yes, in theory, God could have saved us in other ways. But upon reflection, one can see the intrinsic reasonableness for the way that God chose to save us. And Dawkins completely misses this. For us to understand this great gift of salvation that God wants to give us, God needs to speak our language. He needs to reveal and communicate himself in a way that is understandable to us. Now, we can look at ourselves and observe that we have an innate tendency to self-preservation. You know, we might say that we are hardwired, so to speak, to try to preserve our lives. That is a part of human nature. And thus we deeply respect and are moved by examples of people who sacrifice their lives for others. For instance, we are truly, truly grateful to the veterans who died to win the freedom that we enjoy. And we refer to them with esteem when we say that they have made the ultimate sacrifice. We naturally understand that the giving of one's life for another is something honorable and deeply moving. Therefore, if we just naturally understand this, is it not fitting that God, who wants to speak our language or communicate in a way that we can understand, should choose this means the death of his son on the cross as the way to reveal to us the depths of his love for us. What better way would God have to show us how much he loves us and longs to grant us salvation? Viewed this way, the death of Jesus on the cross for our salvation is not madness at all. It bears within it intrinsic reasonableness. However, reason itself, while absolutely essential to the act of faith, is insufficient to believe. Just like the decision to marry is not based on reason alone. Head and heart and God's grace intersect in the act of faith. Similar to the decision to marry, in making the act of faith, we have a personal experience of God whereby we fall in love with him and long to commit our life to him. Faith is not only believing that what God revealed to us is true. It is also a decision to give our lives to him. Pope Benedict spoke of this in his encyclical, God is Love. He says, and I quote, we have come to believe in God's love. In these words, the Christian can express the fundamental decision of his life. Being a Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but the encounter with an event, a person, which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. Similarly, Pope Francis speaks of the joy that comes with a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Pope Francis says, and I quote, The joy of the gospel fills the hearts and lives of all who encounter Jesus. Those who accept his offer of salvation are set free from sin, sorrow, inner emptiness, and loneliness. With Christ, joy is constantly born anew. I invite all Christians everywhere at this very moment to re a renewed personal encounter with Jesus Christ, or at least an openness to letting him encounter them. I ask all of you to do this unfailingly each day. No one should think that this invitation is not meant for him or her 
since no one is excluded from the joy brought by the Lord. The Lord does not disappoint those who take this risk. Whenever we take a step toward Jesus, we come to realize that he is already there, waiting for us with open arms. End of quote. At the heart of faith is a personal experience of God and his love, which results in a desire for us to give our lives to God. In this way, faith is a matter of the heart. Now, the new atheists do raise a reasonable objection to religious experience. They ask, how does one know that this experience is authentic? It is utterly subjective. It is unreasonable. There is no rational basis for this claimed experience. Could I have been deluded? However, remember that head and heart and God's grace intersect in an act of faith. Faith is not mere subjective experience devoid of reason. For instance, I can use my head to evaluate my experience of God and see that it is similar to the testimony of others who have also experienced of God. I can see that my experience of God is consistent with the millions and millions and millions of believers throughout the centuries who have testified to their faith in Christ. And I can see that my experience of God is consistent with the experience of God written about in the sacred scriptures. Here again, head and heart intersect to show and illustrate that my experience of God and God's love is real and is in fact reasonable. Faith is a gift from God. God reveals himself to us and gives us the supernatural strength to believe. Faith is the intersection of head and heart and God's grace, whereby we believe that what God has revealed to us is true, and in light of a personal experience of God and his love, and strengthened and empowered by his grace, we return that love and commit our lives to him. As such, Faith is a gift that we receive from God. It must be free. It cannot be forced. Faith is reasonable, but reason alone cannot account for faith. Head, heart, and God's grace intersect for us to make an act of faith. Thus, true faith is inseparable from reason. Having examined the act of faith, I now turn back to religious extremism. Here I argue that religious extremism is not faith at all, because it has separated faith from reason. Devoid of reason, it spirals out of control and into horrible atrocities. However, in contrast, because true faith is inseparable from reason, faith as such, faith per se, is not subject to the critique of the new atheists, for they have misunderstood what faith is. In summary, I propose that we enter into charitable dialogue with our atheist friends by starting conversations about what we share in common. And in exploring these areas of common ground, we are also able to explain the reasonableness of our faith. In light of this common ground and respectful dialogue, we can call atheists our friends. And of course, if we cannot find common ground to enter into dialogue with our atheist friends, let's just go have a beer. <laughs>